Good afternoon, everyone. I am John Suho. People call me John Suho. Uh, I'm a security engineer at InterSystems. Uh, most of my time is spent doing vulnerability management, but they let me moonlight by giving presentations about fun security topics like this one on OAuth 2 fundamentals. Um, this session will focus on general concepts in OAuth 2, and the following session will discuss using OAuth 2 with InterSystems products. So this is a pretty complex topic. So while you won't know everything there is to know about OAuth 2 at the end of this, you should have enough of a primer to understand a lot more of the documentation and the many OAuth 2 resources that are out there. <coughs> so the gist of it, OAuth 2, open authorization, is a framework to grant permissions on particular resources so that others can access them in the specific ways intended. And we'll spend uh, this session going over these things. First, I'm going to tell you a story about access. Then I'm going to explain um, the term OAuth 2 itself and uh, some general things about it. Then we're going to review OAuth 2 terminology. We're going to discuss um, the delightful age-old topic of authorization versus authentication. Uh, then we'll cover confidential and public clients and client IDs and secrets. With that in mind, we'll be able to talk about the different grant types, which are authorization flows in OAuth 2. And we'll briefly touch on OpenID Connect, which is an extension to OAuth 2 that is used for authentication rather than authorization. But first, let's talk about owning a lot of cars and letting people borrow them. <clears throat> this is a story about access and cars. So, let's say there's a very rich individual who owns many specialty and luxury vehicles, uh, and they keep them in this very fancy attended uh, garage. So they have an RV, they have a limo, they have a Batmobile because they have Batmobile money, they have a riding lawnmower because they have riding lawnmower money. And, of course, as the owner, they're allowed to, they have full permission to do whatever they want with any and all of these vehicles. But let's say they have some employees or gig workers that they'd like to give specific access to some of these vehicles. For instance, there's an intern, they want to allow them to go inside the RV to restock the soda in case they go impulse camping. Um, let's say they have a chauffeur, they want to uh, let use the limo out on the street so they can come pick them up, but they only want to let them use the Batmobile inside the garage just to see that it's still working. And there's some random gig worker that they've never met and they want to give them full access to their lawnmower so they can drive it out and mow their many lawns. Uh, this can be done with the help of different parties involved at the parking garage, the front desk worker and the garage attendant. And I'll be upfront with you, there are a couple different front desk workers at different counters that will be involved. So let's see what happens when one of these uh, employees or gig workers tries to get access. The gig worker approaches the front desk and asks to access the owner's lawnmower. My name is Doug Smith. I registered earlier here as a gig worker. I'd like to have full access permission to Sarah Peterson's lawnmower. The desk worker replies, all right, sir. Let me just check to make sure that's all right with Ms. Peterson. The front desk worker calls the vehicle owner and confirms that it's her. Hello, this is Sarah Peterson. Yes, this is Sarah Peterson. This is the garage front desk. There's a Doug Smith who wants full access permission to your lawnmower. Is that okay? Yes, you can give Doug Smith that access. All right, sir, Ms. Ms. Peterson has agreed to give you access. Take this code on this paper over to that counter over there. They'll check your ID and then issue you a ticket for access. So the gig worker submits the paper with the code to the other counter and he shows his ID. All right, Mr. Smith, here is your ticket specifying that you have full access permission to Sarah Peterson's lawnmower. Let me just stamp that so they know it's authentic. Just show that to the garage attendant. The gig worker goes to the garage attendant and presents his ticket. Hi, I have this ticket stating that I have full permission on Sarah Peterson's lawnmower. The garage attendant checks the ticket to make sure the stamp is real and everything is in order, and then grants access uh, to the lawnmower at the level desired. So that was a long story about access. Why does it matter? Why is it such a big whoop? And why did we have to jump through all those hoops? Well, 
What does this let us do? It gives us the ability to grant specific permissions to a third party to access only the things we want them to have access to, rather than the binary of granting them access to everything or not being able to access anything. Before this, there was no system worked out to grant access to the stuff. Only the owner was supposed to have access to that, no matter how it would convenient, convenient it would be for other people to get to that lawnmower. The only way to grant access to other people was to have them put on a wig and have them pretend to be you. Uh, and in that case, they would have full access to all of the things, uh, whether that's what you wanted or not. Now, of course, all this is a metaphor. Let's look at what we're actually interested in and then tell the same story again. So you're someone who owns things, but these things are probably not multiple specialty vehicles. They're probably things like an email account, a calendar, an online storage drive, a photos account, likely from, say, the same large provider. And let's say you want to give a graphic design application to uh, permission to view or download your photos, but not necessarily to modify or delete them in order to make it easier for that graphic design application to import and edit them or you want to give a backup solution uh, full access to upload, create, and delete things on the online storage drive so it can manage the backups and the purges. Or you want to allow video conferencing to uh, be able to send email invites, but not to read the contents of your inbox. Um, so we can do that. The story works the same way. <clears throat> the client application, which is previously registered with an authorization server, wants access to a particular resource owned by a user. They request this from the authorization server. The authorization server uh, then reaches out to the resource owner and authenticates them to make sure it's them. The resource owner is asked whether or not access should be granted to the app requesting it. If approved, that app gets a code, which they can submit, along with proof of identity, to the authorization server in exchange for a token, which might be signed uh, and which will definitely spell out their permissions. And the client app can submit that token to a resource server, which will check its validity and then allow access to the desired resource. I'm gonna put a big asterisk next to all of this. The exact details and sequence of how the different parties communicate with each other, like how they check identity and how the token actually gets to the client, all of that can vary greatly. Um, so don't get too tied to the details of this flow because there's lots of variations, some of which we'll look at later, but admittedly in a large nutshell, that's the basic premise of OAuth 2. And now the reason this way of doing things is important is it lets us grant access in a granular fashion. Previously, the only way to access these resources would be for the app to log in as you, which would require giving the app your username and password. And in that situation, they would have full access to everything you owned. So this new way is decidedly better. Okay, with that story in mind, just some, uh, just some discussion of what OAuth 2 is. OAuth is an open standard for access delegation. It stands for Open Authorization. Uh, it comes from that RFC dated uh, 2012. You're probably asking, what about OAuth 1? And in short, don't worry about it. It's older, obviously. It was never popular, it had security problems, and it was superseded by OAuth 2 a long time ago. Uh, OAuth sits on top of HTTP. The RFC explicitly reads, this specification is designed for use with HTTP. All of the communication is HTTP requests and responses, so you'll be dealing with web clients and web applications. OAuth assumes secure communication. The HTTP requests are assumed and should be protected with SSL TLS to make sure there's no eavesdropping, no message alteration, or man in the middle meaning that clients should connect using SSL TLS and all the web servers should be set up for SSL TLS. That way no one can steal the token or anything like that. And some browsers, in fact, may be expecting this and might not properly pass on certain messages if they detect there is not SSL TLS. Okay, uh, let's review some OAuth 2 roles and other terms, some of them we saw in our story earlier. First, the term roles itself. Um, 
This is not the same as IRIS or CACHE security roles, if you're used to seeing those. Roles in OAuth 2 simply refer to the different entities or parties involved. So here are a lot of them. Uh, so we have some terms that will be roles, others that are not roles. Let's step through them in no particular order. The resources are the things to be accessed, the particular data or operations the applications want to get a hold of. Scopes are the specific permissions being requested. They're just strings that the different parties are going to interpret based on their own logic. A resource owner is the person or entity that owns the resource and is able to grant access to others. This is usually a human user, but it could also be something like a service account on a back end. Uh, the client is the application that is requesting access to the resource. Sometimes it's also called the relying party. The authorization server is the entity that is able to grant access tokens to the client after the owner gives authorization. The resource server is the server that actually hosts the resource and which will, when presented with the token, give the client the actual access that it wants and return whatever it's supposed to return. Um, let's talk about access tokens. Uh, these come in a few different formats. Um, one is JWTs, JSON Web Tokens. It's kind of a standard format that can just always be read. They can be signed. I would, it's not in the spec, but I would argue that you should always sign it um, so that no one can pretend to make a token from you. Um, the other is an opa uh, opaque token. These are proprietary string formats. They can't be read directly. You have to send them back to the uh, auth server to read them. Uh, let me explain how that works. So going back to our diagram, here, instead of spelling out what the scopes are and all that on the token, the token just has a label. And so when the client app sends that to the resource server, <clears throat> the resource server has to send that token back to the auth server to have its validity checked and its scopes and contents sent back to it. And after that, then the resource server can uh, grant access to the desired resource at the desired scope. Okay, endpoints. These are different URIs on the authorization server that provide different functions. Um, there's an authorization endpoint. This is where the user, the resource owner, can approve access to uh, uh, grant authorization to the client app. The token endpoint, where the client actually asks for a token. The introspection endpoint, where the resource server submits a token to have it checked. And there are some others too, but these are the big ones. Grant types. These are the different options or flows of the procedure between the auth server, the resource server, the resource owner, and the client. Um, they're basically differences in the methods and requirements for the user and the client to uh, prove their identity to the auth server before they can get tokens. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at these later. Very briefly, audience. This is a field that can go into the access token to specify which resource server it can be used with. Um, some resource servers are very stringent about putting the audience in there, some are not. About requiring the audience to be put in there. Okay, so those are some of our terms. Let's switch gears and uh, <clears throat> talk about authorization versus authentication. And remind you that OAuth is open authorization. Okay, so we'll talk about authentication first. Authentication, um, is a process of proving identity. It asks the question, who are you? Authorization uh, is a process of granting access or permissions or privileges. Authorization asks the question, what are you allowed to do? OAuth stands for authorization. The purpose of OAuth is granting privileges, not about checking identity, but before granting privileges, usually the authorization server will check the identity of the resource owner and the client. Usually, before a resource owner can grant permission on the share, to share resources, they'll need to authenticate and prove to the auth server that they're really the resource owner. And usually, before a client can uh, get an uh, access token, they had to authenticate themselves to the authorization server. Now, Authenticating the user is usually pretty straightforward. Users are usually human. They usually just sign into a login page. Sometimes they're not human. They log in with credentials another way. This is, this is fairly straightforward. Client authentication can be more complicated. So 
briefly in our story, we mentioned that you know, the gig worker had registered with the front desk and that the client app had registered with the authorization server. Um, so at registration time, the authorization server is going to give the client a client ID. This is akin to a username for that client. They might, emphasis on might, uh, give the client a client secret. Okay, this can be thought of as akin to a password. Now, whether or not a client uh, gets issued a client secret depends on whether or not the client is gonna be able to keep that secret safe. A, we call a client a confidential client if it runs in a controlled environment and can be given a secret because it won't be stolen, right? Then they can authenticate using their client ID and client secret kind of as username and password. A public client runs in an uncontrolled environment. Uh, it can't guarantee that a secret won't be stolen, so it can't be given a secret, and we'll have to figure out another way to authenticate these clients. Um, public clients are things like native apps that run locally on the user's computer or their phone, or a single page app that runs entirely in the browser because you know browsers are uncontrolled environments. Confidential clients run on backend servers, either things that you know, serve things to a web server downstream or things that don't have a front end at all. You can put secrets there, they'll be safe. Now that we understand uh, public and confidential clients and IDs and secrets, we'll talk about the grant types. <clears throat> Remember earlier when we looked at this diagram and said, hey, asterisk, because there's all sorts of different variations in the details? Those variations in the details are the grant types. The Variations on flow or procedure of interaction between the auth server, the client, and the resource owner uh, that get followed before the client eventually gets an access token. Many of the differences between the grant types are differences in how the client and the resource owner are authenticated. So here's a list of the grant types. We've sorted them by which ones are usable by confidential clients and which ones are usable by uh, confidential or public clients, and the really important ones we've bolded, authorization code and authorization code with PKCE. Um, I'm gonna give a rundown of those two and how they work. So both authorization code and authorization code with PKCE grant types follow this procedure. The only difference is in how the client authenticates. The client is gonna send the user's browser to the auth server with a request for the permissions. Okay, the user's browser is gonna to get to the auth server. If they haven't authenticated, they'll authenticate. And then the user in the browser at the auth server will agree to grant permissions to the client. And then the auth server is gonna redirect the user's browser back to the client application using the client redirect URL and send along an authorization code. The client app is going to authenticate itself to the auth server and send the authorization code. So it'll send the authorization code and will send proof of its identity. And in response, the auth server will send a token directly back to the client. And then the client can you know, use that however it wants, send it to the resource server. Um, very quick reminder, browsers aren't secure, so we're gonna, in this flow, try not to send the token through the browser. So let's break it down. We have the resource owner's browser, the client app, which has a, a confidential client, so it has a client secret and ID, and the authorization server. So first, the resource owner's browser accesses the client application. The client application redirects that browser to the authorization server, and in the URL, they put in the client ID and the scopes they want. That redirect reaches the authorization server. The authorization server serves up a login page, makes the user sign in, the user signs in, the user approves access to those uh, scopes, and then the auth server redirects the browser back to the client app. And in that you redirect URL, it includes this authorization code. So that goes through the browser, reaches the client, the client now has that authorization code. Uh, the client presents the authorization code and it used, sends the client secret and the client ID, because that's how a confidential client is able to um, authenticate itself in this flow. The authorization server gets that auth code, 
gets proof of the client app's identity with the client secret and ID. It sends back an access token, great. This is the grant type. The uh, client app can then, you know, send out that token to whatever resource server it needs to. The authorization code with PKCE grant type is a variant of this. PKCE, also pronounced PIXI, stands for Proof Key for Code Exchange. See that RFC? And it doesn't use a client secret. Instead, it uses a temporary code challenge. Um, no client secret means that it can be used by both confidential and public clients. So let's go over some of the differences with PKCE versus not PKCE and authorization code grant type. Um, with PKCE, the client passes that code challenge to the auth server in the URL. The auth server saves that code challenge. Then later, when the client authenticates itself, instead of sending the client secret, it sends a code verifier, which is related to and derived from the code challenge, and the auth server can validate that. So it's kind of like a temporary client secret, uh, is how I think of it. So here's the big overview with all of the differences uh, in little lavender boxes, so let's just step through this in chunks. So first, the resource owner's browser accesses the client app, the client app redirects them to the auth server, um, and in the redirect URL, they send the code challenge. Um, the browser reaches out to the authorization server, the authorization server saves that code challenge from that redirect URL, and then, like before, the auth server makes the user log in, the user uh, approves access, and then the auth server uh, sends an authorization code back in the URL. That authorization code goes through the browser, gets redirected to the client, the client receives that authorization code, so they, and then the client is able to reach out directly to the auth server. They send that authorization code, they send their client ID, and they also send this code verifier, which gets checked against the code challenge that was sent earlier, and then, the auth server sends a token, which the client can use against resource server as it sees fit. Okay, let's go back to our list of grant types. We're gonna talk about implicit next and then about the rest of them. We have to talk about implicit even though you shouldn't use it. It's not secure, but it is part of the standard, so let's describe it. Uh, how does it check the client's identity? It does not. Instead of sending an authorization code that the client can trade for a token, the authorization server just sends the token back in the redirect, meaning it goes through the browser. That's not secure. Uh, really, this is a holdover from earlier days in OAuth 2. Uh, it's one of the oldest grant types, and I don't think the others had been invented yet. It doesn't need a client secret, so you can use it as a public client, but don't unless you have a very good reason that you've cleared with your security admin. Um, we're not gonna step through all of this. I'm just gonna point you to number item six here with the highlight in yellow. Uh, in the HTTP redirect, instead of a code, it's just the token itself, so the client never reaches out to the auth server directly. It just gets the token uh, through this redirect UI in the browser, and it never has to prove who it is. Um, the these next three grant types are very similar, so we'll just talk about all of them together. They're only for confidential clients because they require secrets or things very much like secrets. There are no redirects in the browser. The, instead of sending the uh, resource owner, the user, to the auth server to authenticate, the client is gonna authenticate for the uh, resource owner, uh, meaning the owner needs to have real trust in the client. So let's, let's look at some of these. There's the password grant type, where the owner trusts the client so much, they just give their username and password to the client, and then the client can um, log in for them directly. It's kind of like the giving the gig worker a wig and having them pretend to be you metaphor. So the client's gonna send the username and password of the resource owner, but they're also gonna send their client ID and client secret for them as the client. They're gonna send that off to the auth server, they're gonna get a token back, and then they can use that token you know, with resource servers. That's password grant type. Client credentials grant type is even simpler. Um, in client credentials, uh, you'd use this for a background application with like a service account, because um, the client in client credentials, there is no, the resource owner is the client, right? You're not dealing with a human user, you're dealing with a service account, 
it doesn't have to get someone else's credentials, it just uses its own credentials and there's only one set. So it just sends the client ID and the client secret and gets back a token, right? <sighs> JWT authorization grant type is basically the same as client credentials, but you don't use a client secret per se. Um, you make the request for the token in the form of a JWT, and then you can sign that JWT with a private key that the uh, client has, and then the auth server can prove identity by checking the signature with the public key. And again, only for confidential clients, because you need a private key that should be kept secret. Um, the private and public key can come from a certificate of key pair, but usually they instead come from a JWKS, a JSON web key set, which can be kept dynamically updated between the different members. Um, and JWKSs uh, are also used generally for checking signatures on JWTs everywhere. They're not just used for this grant type. Anywhere you would uh, have a JWT, you can check it with a JWKS to the point where I'm gonna bold that. If you need to check a JWT in OAuth, there'll probably be a JWKS involved. Okay, um, next. We have to talk about um, using OAuth for authentication um, and something called OpenID Connect. I, I refer to this as same plumbing, different purpose. So I'm gonna tell you another story. This is a story about catering. This is a caterer. This caterer is doing business with that car owner that we met earlier. She's throwing an event and wants a cake. She also wants some of that buffet tray chicken. It's pretty good chicken. Uh, and to work with her, obviously the caterer is gonna need her contact information. But instead of getting it from her directly, the caterer knows that the parking garage already has it. So he's just gonna grab it from them. The caterer goes to the front desk of the parking garage and says, I'd like the contact information for Sarah Peterson, who's a vehicle owner here. I already registered here as a gig worker. I might not ever ask for any cars, but I still registered. The front desk worker says, okay, let me clear this with Sarah Peterson. The front desk worker uh, reaches out to the vehicle owner and authenticates them. Uh, the vehicle owner gives permission for the front desk to share her contact information with the caterer. Uh, the caterer gets a code, caterer exchanges that code at another counter for the front desk after proving his identity. And then the caterer gets a ticket that doesn't give him permission on any cars, but which does give him contact information for the specific vehicle owner. And he uses that himself for his own business. The garage attendant in any vehicles are not involved. The caterer just takes the contact information, uses it for his own business proceedings uh, with that vehicle owner. So that's our story. Um, we're not gonna go over it again, but we are gonna talk about uh, how people wanted to use OAuth for authentication. We said that the point of OAuth 2 is to provide authorization, not to provide authentication. But boy, did people wanna use it for authentication because it's great plumbing, as you can see. So they invented OpenID Connect. This is an extension to OAuth 2 uh, that's designed for authentication. So the client can get an ID token that contains information about their user, their name, their username, stuff like that, and you know, proof that they signed in recently with you know, a session and when the token expires. Uh, the ID token is obtained by requesting the OpenID scope or some related scopes. And an ID token is separate from and in addition to any regular access tokens involved. It's not just gonna be lumped in with the other scopes in there, it's gonna get its own token. Um, and like we said, OpenID Connect is used by the client to authenticate the user in its own application. It's not gonna get passed to a resource server like an access token. The client uses the ID token directly. You have almost certainly seen this in the wild. There are buttons on websites that say sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook. Uh, 
And for those, they're, they're not requesting access to your Google Drive, they're not requesting access to your Facebook photos, at least not at first. Um, they, they just want some basic registration information and to know about an active session. Um, some of, we'll go over some OpenID uh, Connect claim, uh, terms, uh, term claims. Um, this is just the information about the user that comes in the form of these name value pairs. If you ask for the OpenID scope or some of these other OpenID related scopes, you'll get various claims back in the form of name value pairs. Um, the user info endpoint, if you already have um, an access token, if you're already using Open, uh, excuse me, OAuth 2, and you just want more information about the user, you can just you know, send your active token to this uh, user info endpoint and instead of sending an ID token that you, know, you then parse, you can use this user info endpoint to just get that information directly. It's just another way to get the information in OpenID. Um, okay, now we have to talk about this. The proper way to do authentication with OAuth is to use OpenID Connect by requesting the OpenID scope, getting an ID token, expecting that ID token, uh, to get the username or when the token expires and any of that other information, or to use the user info endpoint to get the same information. But a lot of those things that a client application might be interested in for auth purposes, authentication purposes, like just getting a username or finding out when a token expires or a session ends, you, well, you, could, you could just get that from a regular access token maybe. So some people make their code do that, but you know, Maybe use the thing that was specifically invented for this purpose? Ultimately, it's your application, so you make those decisions. Um, and that is uh, the large and small of it. Um, we have uh, these various RFCs here if you want to get into the nitty gritty. OpenID Connect uses that standard rather than an RFC. Um, but in general, there's just a lot of information all over the internet about OAuth 2 and OpenID. Um, and a lot of it feels inaccessible unless you have some of the fundamentals down, which hopefully now you do. Uh, and the most important thing you can do is come to the next session and see how to use OAuth 2 with inner systems products. So with that, thank you for letting me take you on this wild ride. I hope I didn't go too fast or make you too furious uh, because I know that we, uh, we covered a lot and uh, I hope uh, I've left you with enough understanding and a drive to learn more. Well, we have a lot more time than expected, so questions? Um, so I think you briefly covered the, the odd claim uh, that was in there. Um, that seems to be a pretty controversial uh, thing. I've seen various interpretations of what's supposed to go there. What is the current, do you know what the current consensus is of um, what's there? As I, underst as I understand it, as best as I was able to tell in the current controversy. The expectation is that it is the resource server that expects that, but check with your resource server. <laughs> they, may, they, may, they may have implemented it differently because it is a framework and people sometimes implement frameworks differently. <laughs> okay.